Okay, we have a lovely intimate group at um, Brisbane CQU site at the moment, and we have over 100 people zooming in. So welcome to those zooming in, because I can't see anything, it feels quite surreal. Um, can I firstly um, acknowledge the traditional owners on the land of which we are doing this presentation, uh, past, present and future, knowing this has always been a place of learning. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge Associate Professor Molly Dragowitz, who was of course successful with um, a Fulbright scholarship that brings Mark with us and we're very excited. Um, at CQ University has also contributed and Mark has um, gladly, I think gladly great, um, to do a presentation on what is Sexual Violence Awareness Month, something we take very seriously, we want to highlight. So today's um, offering by Mark is in relation to that sphere of sexual violence. Now, um, Mark is a experienced SWAT team lieutenant, has been a domestic violence division. He will be talking, as I've mentioned, about sexual assault myths and misconceptions. So um, it will explore a range of, as we've said, myths and misconceptions, victim blaming, false reporting, how it impacts on our beliefs, response investigations and pursuit of justice, how to overcome these barriers, you all want to know that Mark, and men's role in prevention and encouraging reporting of crimes. Now, Mark is also being, is a leading police trainer who has lectured at universities and police academies throughout the world. And so he has um, extensive experience in law enforcement and he's also worked as consultant for government around strategies to prevent DV and in police training and curriculum development. So it's with much pleasure I introduce Mark Wynn. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. And so some of you already can tell by the way I'm speaking, I'm not from Australia. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm from the southern part of the United States. I'm from Tennessee. For some of you have been to the States. Um, and I want to thank you all for inviting me here today and, and the Queensland University of Technology and you all fine folks to talk about this issue. And I, I, let me just acknowledge this. And I think most of you all would agree here and in doing in the other locations. This an hour doesn't do this topic justice. Um, I, I'm going to, I'm just going to scratch the surface, if you will, and talk about some of the difficulties we've had in American policing and in our criminal justice system and in society in general. I, I'm not sure that you all keep up with current events in the states. I, I recommend you don't. It'll make your head hurt. <laughs> um, we've got some of the craziest uh, happenings now in the United States, but this morning, and to give you an example, our president basically told the news media that he feared for young men more than young women because of false allegations of sex assault. And, and I, you all know this is just absolutely ridiculous. Uh, whenever you get politicians involved in issues like this, it always kind of goes sideways, if you will. But what it does, it says to me uh, that we this issue is out in the public. We're talking about sex assault. We're talking about crimes against women. We're talking about domestic violence on a level that we've never, ever talked about before. So I want to touch on some of these issues. And for point of reference, uh, let me give you an example of my hometown. Uh, I'm from Nashville, Tennessee, city of about a million people. Um, in 94, we... 1994, we got to a crisis point where we saw anywhere from 25 to 30 women murdered every year just in our local jurisdiction in domestic violence cases. We had an incredible amount of sex assault. Uh, we had an unbelievable amount of child abuse and elder abuse and human trafficking and stalking. And we created the largest domestic violence police division in U.S. history to work around 23 to 24,000 cases of domestic violence per year in our jurisdiction. Now. That sounds like a lot, um, uh, but let me give you a, a, a couple of the numbers. Chicago police, they'll respond to about 250,000 domestic violence incidents per year. It is the most responded to call in the country, the United States. But for years, we separated domestic violence from sex assault. 
Um, and that was a mistake. We had great domestic violence units. We had minimal response to sex assault. We had really well developed and developing procedures for domestic violence investigations for first responders, but we had weak response to sex assault. And only in the last, I say, uh, 10 years have we, we looked at these crimes in a different way. And I'm going to show you the model that I think more represents these crimes committed against women. And I know there are male victims. I, I, I've investigated crimes where men have been murdered, they've been raped, they've been abused. But I'm going to be more uh, statistically correct than politically correct in that, if you will. Um, our federal government has an office that was created in 1994 through federal legislation called the Violence Against Women Office for that particular reason. Uh, because most of these crimes that we see are committed against women. So I'm going to, I'm going to talk about it in that, in that sense. Um, and by the way, for those of you watching remotely, um, l let's just make this a conversation today. I, uh, I'm not used to training uh, uh, remote students, but I'm excited. Um, but because I like to keep my uh, uh, trainings conversational, as, as I go along and you hear me say something that doesn't make any sense or you want to ask a question about, uh, make sure you, you make note of it. And as we go along, uh, we'll answer the questions because one of the first things I'd like to do with you all uh, at the start of this lecture is I'm going to let you listen to a young woman who uh, had an experience. And I want you to listen to what she says and tell me how you feel about it. So after we watch the video, then in the room here we can do interaction and hopefully we can get some reaction from from the viewers around around the country. So um, that's how we'll play it. And this will run about an hour and hopefully we'll, we'll finish the entire uh, presentation. And if we don't, we don't. We'll get as much of it done as we, as we can. Um, so let me give you a little anecdotal moment, though. And I, and I when I talk about this topic, I, 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 what comes to my mind is is the incredible amount of real progressive policing that I'm watching happen uh, in the United States from some really uh, strong leaders in violence against women issues. And, and one in particular is a friend of mine. He's a deputy chief of police in Salem, Oregon, one of our western cities in the state of Oregon. And Steve Belshaw is his name, and Chief Belshaw, over the last year, instructed all of his patrol officers who respond to domestic violence calls, when they went to the scene of a domestic violence investigation, he asked them to ask an additional question that was not on the field report. And the question was, have you ever been forced to do something of a sexual nature against your will? In other words, a diplomatic way of saying, have you been raped? Right? 85% of the domestic violence victims acknowledge they'd also been raped. This is part of the new awareness for American policing, that we had this large number of sex assault cases that were also part of domestic violence that were going uninvestigated and unacknowledged by law enforcement. Um, my wife, a therapist who's run a domestic violence program for 20 years, transitional housing, where women come in for two years, I think her numbers are nearly 100% of the women who have also been sexually assaulted. I was in a shelter in Florida not that long ago, and I asked the intake director at the emergency shelter how many women come into the shelter have been raped. And she said around 90%. So when we think about rape, generally, though, in law enforcement, we think about stranger rape. You know, the guy behind the bush with a knife, with a ski mask. That happens, there's no question about it, but the vast majority of sex assault cases in the U.S., the offender knows the victim and the victim knows the offender. So having said that, um, let me show you uh, the model that we're training police across the country in today, which I think is a better representation of, of for law enforcement purposes, where we are. And, and by the way, the other part of the problem that we had in, in the states was there was little accountability for law enforcement. Um, the battered women's movement, which I, you know, absolutely agreed with and worked with. I've been training police since 82. I watched them push our country to a, to a, a, a point to where we acknowledge it, we investigate it, we hold offenders accountable. 
but we left out sex assault. We didn't look at it at the same numbers, and that was a major mistake. Uh, so the model that we use today in the states when we talk about any of these issues, it's a more interconnected co-occurring model. When you see domestic violence, you're more likely to see sex assault. If you see sex assault, you'll also see strangulation, which is a particular kind of an assault, which is often prosecuted as an attempted murder case. We're, we're training our officers today to look at strangulation differently than in the past. Uh, we've had strangulation homicides for years, and I worked as a homicide investigator for several years, and we saw these cases of strangulation, but we did not connect them to domestic violence the way we should have. Stalking, which is sort of the next phase in a violent relationship. So these crimes are interconnected and co-occurring, and when we realized that we had a different model of the crime, that meant we had to assign more detectives, more officers, we had to change our training strategies, because these crimes are what we call course of conduct investigations. Now this is critical because historical police training, and I'm the fourth of five generations of police officers in my family, so I've got a long view since the beginning of the last century for my family, the way my family was trained in policing till today, I was trying to do incident-based policing. Incident-based policing means, by necessity, by the way, you catch Bill who broke into Joe's house in a burglary, you charge him with burglary, you prosecute him and move on to the next case. But with a case like this, domestic violence, you may interview the victim and say, tell me what the problem is. She says, it's my husband. And you say, well, tell me all about your husband. And she says, well, it all started about three years ago. And when you say three years ago, in the brain of most cops worldwide is, I don't need to know what happened three years ago, just tell me what happened tonight, then we have ignored the context of the case. And context is everything. We're now changing the view of a contextual picture of the crime, so not only the police can see it, everybody else can see it. And a good example would be how we interview a rape victim when we're asking her, tell me what you said to him before this happened. She says, I said no. In the past, we write no in the report, but we wouldn't describe it. We wouldn't draw a picture of what no looked like. Now we're asking officers to draw the word no. I told him not to put alcohol in my glass. He poured me another drink. Then he poured me another drink and I said no. He pulled me to the bedroom, took my blouse off and I said no. He took my brassiere off and I said no. And when you write the report in that way, you can actually see not only the crime being committed, you can see that there's no consent in this crime, which is often what the offender will say, well, she consented to the crime, and it's our job to understand consent. And I, I think most of you will agree that if fear is in the room, consent's not there. And this is all about consent. So we had to retrain our officers to look at it in a different way. It's been real successful, and I'll show you some of the other things that we're acknowledging and policing today. But once we realized that we had a different model of a crime and we started investigating these crimes correctly, then guess what we saw? We saw all the underlying crimes involved in violence against women. This changed our view, and it's changing our view nationwide now. It's really made us think hard about the resources, where we, how many officers we train, the specialists, what our policies look like, is it clear to officers that sex crime investigation is not a 30 minute, 40 minute interview, it's a much longer detailed investigation. It could be asking the officer to look at post-rape behavior. Um, the, the forensic examination could be completely different. And I'll show you a model out of Oregon that's showing some real promise with keeping the victim involved in the criminal justice system. Because I'm, I'm most of you all probably know rape victims don't really want to get the police involved often. Our numbers are about 16% reporting. Anywhere from 16 to 35%. That's the variance of our reporting in the United States. Now, what's different about policing today is we're asking ourselves, why are those numbers so low? Is it us? And in many cases, it is. And I'll talk about bias in policing as we go along. But I want to show you something. I want you to listen to this young woman. This is a film we use in police trainings. And so I've seen it several times. And it's a, it's a young woman explaining what happened to her, and, and I'll let you decide wh whether you think this is a credible uh, crime. Because as you can as you imagine, I, I've never policed here in Australia, but I would think that the criminal code was pretty basically the same in a lot of ways. The elements of the crime, 
what proof beyond a reasonable doubt looks like for your officers. So watch this and tell me as, as you watch it um, what you're hearing and how you're reacting to this. This is what we want our officers in the states to do. We want them to be an uh, attentive listener, listen for the things that we can see that are elements of non-consensual sex assault, um, where the victim, well, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Let's watch it and then we'll, and then we'll, on the other side, we'll talk about it. I've been raped twice in my life. The first time I was dating an African-American male who's a member of an African-American fraternity. Um, he was a senior and I was a freshman and we started dating at the end of September of my freshman year. I was 17 years old, he was 22 years old. Um, I'd only had sex once before, consensual sex once before um, the night I was raped. And we started dating at the end of September um, and in that relationship I was pretty explicit that I didn't want to have sex with him even though I was attracted to him. He was much more experienced than me. Um, and continually tried to kind of verbally coerce me to have sex with him. It was late at night, I guess between 1 to 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, I went into his room, and at this point I still felt like we were going to participate in the kind of normal activities of our relationship. We, had, had, we were intimate, and we kissed, petted, um, and even engaged in oral sex, but we never had, he never penetrated me before. And um, he was much more verbally persuasive this time, um, asking me if I wanted to have sex, why didn't I want to have sex? And my response each time was I wasn't ready, I didn't want to. He would ask me, I would say no. He would ask me, I would say no. Um, and I'm not sure how long that lasted. It seemed to last about 20 minutes to half an hour. Um, and finally, um, I stopped saying no. I was in this fraternity house. Um, there were at least six other men in the building. And I didn't know what to do other than say no. Um, so when I stopped saying no, he went to his dresser, got a condom, came back to the bed and penetrated me. And um, it was the second time I'd been penetrated in my life, so it was excruciatingly painful. And I became emotionally numb. I withdrew from the experience. I didn't want to be there. And I didn't scream. I didn't know how to scream. Um, so I just was there, kind of numb, kind of dead. Um, watching it happen to me. Um, the experience to me lasted, I guess, about an hour, an hour and a half, um, in which he uh, positioned me in different um, sexual positions. Um, he was on top of me, he put me on the bed, and it penetra me, penetrated me from behind, and put me back on the bed, and he was on top of me. So there's all these kind of different ways that um, he entered me. Um, at the end of the experience, he kissed me, was holding me, and pretended as if it were a consensual act, and um, asked me how it was, and basically I didn't say anything to that, and then we went to sleep. The next morning I woke up, I went back to campus, and pretended it never happened, and it was the last time I was ever in the same room with him alone, or sexually intimate um, with him. I never called that rape. Um, I would tell people that I didn't want to sleep with him, or I wasn't sure about it, but I was afraid to call it rape. So, what, what did you hear? He didn't listen to her. He didn't listen to her? Yeah. And I, I what she he didn't acknowledge what she wanted? No, it's what he wanted. What he wanted, right? What else? What else did you hear? She said in the beginning that there was an age difference. So he was 22, she was 17. And she said, added to that, said he was more experienced than me. He was more experienced than me. Okay. And by the way, it, 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 put your feet in the shoes of a, of a criminal investigator just for a minute. And when you ask these questions, how valuable would they be for you as you're drawing your case for prosecution if we have a case? That would matter to you. The age difference would matter, and the experience level would matter to you as an investigator. Okay. Equality. Yeah. Equality comes into that. Someone's much more experienced. Why? What else did you hear? There were other people. There were other people. There were other.
people she was in a fraternity house in the room. What difference would that make? People who saw witnesses, but what else would she might be afraid of? Um, more people joining. What? Right. 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 More suspects. Yeah. There was a lot of fear there. You could sense the fear in her voice. Okay, that's important. Right. What else did you hear? I heard when she said, I stopped saying no. Mm -hmm. She stopped saying no after a while. She said no and no. So this is going to be documented in your investigation as well. What else? Anything else? Simply because it didn't work. It didn't work. Right. She didn't tell anybody about it. She didn't tell anybody about it. This is a, the other sort of hallmark we see in sex assault cases, self-blame. And I, I give you, I'm going to come back. Let me give you an example. I was training police in St. Petersburg, Russia, several years ago, and the police psychologist said that we believe in provocation in Russia. And I said, What does that mean? She said, If a woman is provocative, she basically deserves what she gets. And I stood in the classroom for a minute, and then I had to acknowledge that that's not just a Russian culture, it's an American culture as well. That traditionally, we have looked at the behavior of the victim and said, what were you doing? What were you drinking? Why were you there? Why were you there? What, and why didn't you leave? Why didn't you report? So the onus is on the victim. And this is traditional. This is not just for the Russians, it's for us as well. And I, I can't speak for, for Australia, but this is some of the, these are the opticals and the myths. And, and, and the other thing was alcohol use. So said, well, you were drinking and what did you expect? But before the end of this session, I'll show you what we call the undetected rapist, that person who is very good at using alcohol as a weapon, not a knife or a gun, but alcohol is used as a weapon very effectively by a, a rapist. And this is the crowd of people that we don't see in law enforcement. We don't catch this group often, but they're the ones committing most of the sex assaults in our country. So anything else did you hear her say that stood out to you? The, um, when she said that she went numb and just let him do what he wants. She went numb. Right. So some psychologists might call that dissociation, where you just completely leave your, you ever heard a crime victim say, I just left my body, I went somewhere else? A good friend of mine, a prosecutor in Denver, had a woman who was raped, a taxi cab driver. She did that, she just went, she dissociated, she just left her body. She couldn't identify the face of the rapist of the law enforcement officer, but she said, the detective was very persistent. He said, well, let's talk about your experience and what you're feeling, what you smell, what you heard, what you expected. Um, was there something that you focused on? And she said, you know, you're exactly right. I did. I focused on the headliner in the taxi cab, and there was a tear in the headliner. Well, the detective put the bulletin out to all the patrol officers. We're looking for a taxi with a tear in the headliner, and it wasn't long. They had the suspect in custody. Even though she couldn't identify the guy, right, she went somewhere else. And this is not unusual. And we'll talk about memory in a, in a minute as well, because that's all obviously impacted too. Trauma is one of our big... Uh, problems in these cases. So here's some of the background. Uh, and this, by the way, would be sort of the checklist if you were looking at this as a criminal offense, which you should be. This would be categorized as a rape for my police department. It was a dating relationship that had different levels of sexual experience. You all talked about that. Uh, and Willie really, really, really engaged in intimate activities, which this confuses people often. Without, she was engaged in that activity. So, you know, why is she complaining about this? And obviously, no is no. No is no is no is what it means. It means no. And to say that men can't stop themselves in the middle of this kind of activity, uh, you're basically saying that men are so primitive and Neanderthal that their brains haven't developed where they can understand the word no. And that's just ridiculous. That's the excuse. Um, no prior penetration. Excuse me. No prior penetration. I'm going to lose my battery here. Let me get. Hold on one second while I plug this computer up. Be right back to you. Okay. No prior penetration and was explicit she did not want to have intercourse. Now this would have been obviously the statement she made would be part of your case as well. Now, the reason I'm showing this case is these cases would not have been prosecuted in the past. 
because of all the misconceptions about, about sex assault. Uh, it was fraternity house. She said no repeatedly. It protracted verbal persuasion for 20 to 30 minutes. She, you know, she stopped saying no at some point. He penetrated for an hour and a half. She didn't know what to do. We've heard victims say they didn't know how to scream. They were frozen. This is, this is you'll see what happens when you're traumatized. Um, how did she demonstrate non-consent? What do you think? Huh? She said no. She said no, right? Yeah. She said no. Um, so what if any crimes have been committed? For your country, for your agency, for your jurisdiction, would this have been a prosecutor as a crime? I, and I don't expect you to answer that. But this is what we're asking ourselves in the States now. Um, these are those cases that aren't prosecuted. And, the, and, the, and, the, and another problem with these cases is these offenders go on to rape more than just one. Rapists don't usually rape once. And I'll give you a great example of it. Right now in the United States, we've got one half million untested sex assault kits in shelves and police lockers all over the United States. A half million. They're beginning to test them. We've got a national initiative to test all our untested kits and compare them to our, our national database for DNA. Um, CODIS is what they call it. We've been taking DNA from prisoners for the last 25 years. Now we're testing these kids. In one city alone in Detroit, they caught 800 serial rapists, 800 who's committed crimes in 29 states. So these offenders just don't rape once. They go on over and over and over again. So we realized the, a bigger mistake for the whole country was we were pushing rape victims away. We were asking them questions like, they were being interrogated, they were interviewed, and they walked away from the police investigation. So the victim's reality in this case, she was explicit, she didn't want to have intercourse. She didn't know what to do. This, this would be the checklist that a police officer would present to a prosecutor and say, she was aware of the environment, there were six other men there. She didn't scream, she didn't know how to scream. She withdrew, she pretended it didn't happen. She was afraid to call. Reluctance and delayed reporting validates the victim's statement often. It makes sense why you wouldn't report it to police because we all know what happens when you're a rape victim and you report you have to talk to a nurse, a doctor, a prosecutor, a police officer, an investigator, a judge, a jury, 30, 40, 50 people and tell them the most embarrassing things that have ever happened to you. This plays to the benefit of the rapist, by the way. Unable to be alone after this is some post-rape behavior that we normally see. The, the PTSD from the rape, right? the, the trauma of it, the, the lifelong trauma of it being a rape victim is, is something that we're studying more and more. Reluctance, they feel guilty, uh, possible prior sexual contact, uh, alcohol and drugs involved. This is, brings on guilt one time. If I only didn't drink this much, this wouldn't have happened to me. Uh, victims blame themselves. Uh, no physical injuries. There's a lot of myths about, well, if you were raped, you would have fought him off. There'd be scratches and bruises and broken bones. That's not true. People submit to stay alive, therefore you won't see physical injuries often. And these are again some of those myths that we saw for years. And the question of consent, was it consensual? This, this often comes up in our, in our non-stranger sex assault cases, which is what we see most all, often in our states. Our Center for Disease Control took a look at sex assault in 2010, and some of these numbers are pretty shocking. I, I have to tell you, it's Again, much bigger than we ever suspected. One in five women have been raped or have been attempted rape in their lifetime, one in 71 men. And sexual violence victimizations other than rape, that's coercion, and one in sexual contact, as one in two. One in two women. That's half the population of women in our country. But for rape itself, around 32 million U.S. women will be victims of completed attempted rape in their lifetime. Now, we don't see these numbers in law enforcement and for, for a lot of reasons, which we'll talk about, but the prevalence of sex assault is, is, is much bigger than, again, we ever suspected. So historically, you know, if we're talking about men directing violence against women, but men can be the victims as well. And LGBTQI victimization is very unreported. We're just now starting to talk to this community about their reluctance report for a lot of other reasons. We've got incredible amount of immigrant women in the United States who are not reporting today because they're worried about deportation. Now, I've got friends who police in Houston and Columbus, Ohio and Cincinnati and Dallas, Texas, who say the numbers of sex assault of immigrant women have gone to nothing because if they call the police, they're worried that the Border Patrol will put them out of the country. So the 
For the rapist, this has been a windfall. If you want to find a perfect victim to rape, find someone who's not going to report because of immigration status. These are very clever offenders. They know exactly how to find that particular kind of victim. Now, something else that's, that's we're, we're just now starting to acknowledge is the crimes committed in Indian country in the United States. Our Native American Indians have been the victims of, well, they've been victims of crime since the beginning. Um, we've decimated our Indian populations in the United States to a level that's just, it's, uh, it's just kind of mind boggling to me. And I've trained for the Sioux and the Navajo and the Sunni and the Apache reservations in the United States and, and try and talk to the officers in these reservations. And they often tell me that most crime committed in Indian country is committed by non-Indians. Now, I'm not sure whether the comparison is here with the Aboriginal women here in Australia, but we've had a big problem with this. So there's new awareness. So two thirds of the perpetrators are non-Indians. And up until very recently, these offenders could not be arrested by Indian police. We have Indian police uh, all over the United States, but they weren't allowed by law to arrest non-Indians until just a few years ago. Now the Indian police can now arrest non-Indians on reservation charged with these crimes. So many small remote tribes, and there are many of these around the country, many more of these in larger tribes, don't have tribal courts. Uh, so they had to depend on the federal courts to prosecute their cases, which can be, uh, you know, very hard to do for a small, small reservation. You have to get the FBI involved in all this and it becomes a federal offense and it's much more difficult. So uh, the rape in any country is impacted uh, those communities in, in a big way. 567 federal recognized tribes in the United States totaling about 5 million total. Um, you know, I was just in Canada uh, doing some training for the, with, with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. And they have this same problem with their first citizens in Canada as well, but they've got a project now where they've acknowledged that they, there's around 1,500 first citizen women in Canada they can't find. And they think the number is even higher than that. Up to 4,000 women have disappeared. They think a lot of these are women who, who fled domestic violence. A lot of them have been victims of serial killers, like or victims of spousal homicide that they, uh, where the spouse has killed them. But you can see these populations are, are so remote. We've got a lot of work to do with our, with our natives. Again, 16% of our rape, uh, uh, rape cases reported to police. That's our numbers we see in the United States. It's the most unreported crime. And then when you get into these other communities like men, men don't report rape often because of the stigma uh, of the rape. And we certainly see rape in our prison systems in the United States. So legacy numbers, around 84,000. This means that's 84,000 reported to law enforcement with a legacy definition. In 2013, our Federal Bureau of Investigation changed the definition of rape. Up until that time, it was in 1927, the definition of rape was the unlawful carnal knowledge of a female using force against her will. So from 1927 to 2013, we don't know how many women have been raped in the United States. We have no idea because we kept numbers on stranger rape, not uh, non-stranger rape. Non-stranger rape is where we see most of our cases. Now we change the definition and guess what's happening? The numbers are starting to go up. The public is asking us, why are you not aware of this? And we're trying to explain to the public now, well, we haven't trained our officers. We haven't had policies on it. We haven't made it a, a, a priority. That's changing now. Um, our, again, our numbers, uh, Around uh, one in five women, I showed you this earlier, we've got 157 million women in the United States, and one in five of them will be victims of a sex assault or attempted rape. And here's something else that we're starting to acknowledge in the States is that these crimes not only are interconnected, co-occurring, there's common characteristics to the crime. You'll see course of conduct, which I explained earlier, multiple recurrent crimes, elder abuse, child abuse, vandalism, sex assault, traumatic impact. I'll show you uh, what I'm talking about with trauma in, in just a minute because trauma has been one of our, I think, one of my most damaging myths because in the past our police would interview a victim 30 minutes after the assault and she couldn't identify the offender, she couldn't remember everything that happened, and the untrained officer would write this report as a false report or unfounded, and we'd move on to the next case, and that was a major mistake. We weren't training our police to understand what trauma looked like. Uh, minimization by the victim. And minimization to me is evidence. Uh, when someone's minimizing the fact that they were assaulted, that is normal for most victims of these crimes. 
Underreported, obviously, 16%. And the serial nature of the perpetrator moving from one rape victim to the other. Do you have a tip, sir? I'm sorry, you thought you raised your hand. No, no, it's just yeah. not So commonly missed crimes. And by the way, this slide that I just showed you, and this slide, this is from interviewing around 800 police chiefs nationwide. This comes from law enforcement. Law enforcement now is doing something that I think is absolutely necessary. You've got to admit your past problems before you can move on to the next level. If you don't admit your past problems, then the crime victims know it. The community knows it, right? So everyone in your society knows that you haven't done it right all these years, and you haven't acknowledged that. You've got to acknowledge you've done it wrong because the solution is not just with police, it's with the community. You've got to have community involvement with these cases. So police have told us, police chiefs have said that these are the crimes that we miss. We miss stalking and sex assault, strangulation. These are major crimes that for years we've missed, but now we're going back. We're self-assessing ourselves. We're training our officers to understand the intricate issues, the complexity of these crimes, and we're seeing some results. But I wanted to show you a couple of other things. A trauma-informed response means you're considering the the the, I think the, the, one of the byproducts of these crimes is what you do to a person's brain, the, the, the neurobiology of the crime, the, the damage you do to the memory. And this is not new just to crime victims. We've seen it with our own police. It's not unusual to see a police officer involved in a traumatic event that can't remember everything. And these are trained, you know, these are highly trained people who remain focused when everybody else is out of control. But we know that the brain is the brain is the brain, so it doesn't matter who it is, it's a cop or, or a sex assault victim, you may see that trauma as well. So delayed reporting, uh, inability to recall details, this is this is typical. In the past, we'd read it and say, ah, let's put her on a polygraph, or she's not telling the truth, or she's making it up, or this other man, well, she's just trying to get somebody in trouble. And these are all myths that kept the victim from reporting. Now that we're acknowledging that, we're acknowledging that there's impact, and not only can it be impact immediately, it can be lifelong. Uh, trauma can be something that you deal with lifelong. Uh, and we're seeing that in our victims. And the way you deal with the rape victim can make it worse if you're a first responder. The, the healing of that victim, because if you start asking victims why, we've, we've sort of taken the word why completely out of our vocabulary in law enforcement, and it's not been easy to do because the initial training for cops has been who, what, when, where, how, those basics we teach cops every day to detect crime. But the word why for this victim, what would you imagine it does to that victim when I ask you why? It's a blaming question. That's a blaming question. You automatically blame yourself, right? So traumatic memory is stored in the brain differently, and we'll talk about that. I've got a little small video I'll show you on that. Uh, impacts of trauma are frequently misinterpreted as not telling the truth, and that's been the biggest part of the misconceptions for law enforcement and sex assault victims that we're now just getting over. She stops and Now, how much time do we have? Oh, I don't want to... We have closer to a day, about 15 minutes. We have 15 more minutes. Can I have two more hours? <laughs> we would love you to have two well, let me, let me, just a real quick, on the screen that you're looking at right now, I recommend uh, after you uh, finish, we finish this class, go to your Google machine <laughs> and go to YouTube and type in this into your YouTube search window later on to watch. It's 22 minutes. This, this is a really well done film created by the Michigan Prosecutors Association along with law enforcement. And it's basically for first responders to understand the problems with traumatized uh, uh, victims of sex assault. Let me show you a minute uh, of this, uh, just to, to show you what I, exactly what I'm talking about. And you're gonna see Rebecca Campbell, she's a psychologist at Michigan State, who's one of our authorities in the States on the neurobiology of trauma. She stops and she starts. She contradicts herself, she goes back. Talk louder. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Thank you very much. Let me see if I can turn it up. She stops and she starts. She contradicts herself. She goes backwards and forwards. What she says doesn't make sense. Or when she's describing it, she's not crying. She's not upset. She's like totally flat. The victim that may appear, as if she may not have the story all together. Often survivors are asked, well, why didn't you just run out the door or tell someone or scream or, or say no? 
Um, but what it, what has um, what I've heard survivors talk about is um, feeling a sense of just even just frozen. There is no typical response to sexual assault. So while victims can remember things differently, they don't necessarily remember things chronologically. Uh, they may get things out of order. I knew from my research as a psychologist what they were actually seeing was trauma. What they were seeing was the neurobiology of trauma. As law enforcement officers, we recognize that this is not just a job, it's a calling. Seeking justice, helping people, and making a difference are all part of what makes this profession so rewarding. More than 30 years of police work and my time as a national advisor and trainer on sexual assault have taught me that the first interaction between a law enforcement officer and a sexual assault victim will make or break our opportunities for success and justice in these cases. Our first interactions with victims also have a profound impact on a victim's ability to recover from the trauma of sexual assault, making this one of the most complex violent crimes that we respond to. Unfortunately, many of us didn't receive the in-depth training needed to respond effectively to these cases. We often misinterpreted victims' reactions to trauma, which discouraged victims from participating in the criminal justice system and resulted in offenders not being held accountable for their crimes. Much like we are more informed today about police officer trauma following critical incidents, research and experience informs us that we need to educate ourselves on the science behind sexual assault victims' reactions to trauma. Sexual assault response and investigations training has now advanced to include a trauma-informed approach to sexual assault. This will help us understand sexual assault victims' actions, responses, and their ability to recall details of the crime. In part one... So th this is a, a small version of a 22-minute film. Please take a look at it. Tom Tremblay, one of the instructors here, talks about police trauma. We know a lot about police trauma. Because for years, and I've investigated officer-involved shootings, officer-involved incidents, and, and high-speed pursuits, and you interview the officer, they'd leave, would leave things out of the interview, and I would tell the officer, don't lie, you have to be honest when you tell me what happened, and they would say, I'm telling the truth, I only fired my weapon twice when they fired the weapon eight times. So now, we've acknowledged this, we've acknowledged it because now if an officer is involved in a shooting in the States, that we send them home for two days to sleep cycles, we tell them to put their feet up, get an adult beverage, turn on the sponge pants Bob show, whatever that thing is. In other words, get their mind off of it and their memory will start to migrate a bit and you'll get a more clear, precise statement. By the way, it, we think it is such an important aspect of policing all across the United States now. It's not unusual to see a police officer and advocate go back to the scene the next day to do secondary interviews with a victim. Safety planning, you know, a, a, a complete different interview considering the trauma involved with the victim. And we're seeing a, we're seeing a real difference. Victims now are not being forced. Um, I think at the name of the, where is it? It's in Oregon. It's Southern Oregon, um, a little community, and I'll think of the name of the city in a minute. I'm sorry. Started a program called You Have Options. Another Google moment. Go to your Google, but you have options. Ashland, Oregon. Ashland, Oregon. Sorry, it took me a minute to find it. Ashland found that their police procedure was pushing victims away. The traditional police you know, approach was, Okay, now you claim you've been raped. Let's get you to the hospital. We have to do a rape exam. We have to talk to the doctor and the nurse. A lot of rape victims were saying, no, 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 I don't want to do that. Please, I, I'm overwhelmed already. And they were, they were marking the cases inactive. They were closed the case. And the problem, obviously, was there was no justice for that victim. And that offender went on to rape other women. So they changed their method. They say, now they say to the victim, we'll move at your speed. You want to do a kit? We'll do the exam. You want to write a report? We'll put in a Jane Doe. We'll move at your space. We'll get you a great crisis counselor. You talk to her for three, four days before we move on. Now they're making cases because of the victim staying in the system longer. But in the past, we did 30 minutes. We would ask the victim what happened, and she would say, I don't remember all of it. I only remember one or two things. And we'd say, well, look, ma'am, look, we're not going to get into this case. And we were pushing victims away from justice, basically. So the law wasn't keeping its promise to these victims. Now, because of the awareness now in the states, we've got activism coast to coast. Um, every day, there's another case, another study, another moment where, you know, women, especially women now are saying, look, this is a national problem. We've got to change the way our criminal justice system is dealing with sex assault, and we are. Uh, our last president, President Obama, you probably remember President Obama, uh, who was our last <laughs> president. 
this was a big, big, big issue for him. Uh, vice President Biden, his vice president, actually co-wrote our Violence Against Women Act. It was an act in 94. These were two men dedicated to stopping crimes against women. They had a summit at the White House to talk about sex assault, one of the very first. Uh, and all the information, uh, the, the, you just go to White House Summit on Sex Assault, you'll see the volumes of information that were published about strategies and standards and how we deal with sex assault in the country. Not alone, one of the first documents written on sex assault, especially on college campuses. Sex assault on college campuses is about twice as high as it is in the general public. Concentration of, of people. And by the way, from these White House uh, summits, that our Department of Education uh, told uh, us, <coughs> law enforcement, they believe this is the number one reason why young women drop out of college in the freshman year and never go back to college again because of sex assault. And think about this for a second. It's already hard enough for a woman to make it in life, you know, just with a general degree. But if you don't have a college degree and you're a woman in today's society, it's twice as hard for you. So the rape itself was not only, you know, damaging that person, it was damaging the, their life of, the, you know, the career, their, their livelihood for, for that one rape. It just had the footprint of this crime is, is long lasting. And this is what the summits have told us. Our colleges now, nationwide, all of our, our, new federal, our universities get federal funding have a program called Title IX. It's an act in the law that says that campuses have to be violent free, they have to be free of harassment, they have to be free of sex assault. So college campus police nationwide now are getting much better at investigating sex crimes than they were in the past. And these, they, and by the way, what I'm showing you here is very recent. This is just in the last few years that we started to acknowledge we've got high numbers of sex assault. A community coordinated response. I know one of the questions from one of the, one of the uh, uh, viewing areas was, how do we bring these folks together? And I'm a big, big advocate for community coordinated response. When you work together, when police and advocates and courts and hospitals and schools work together, it's harder for the offender to defeat a group of people versus a singular police department or a court. For domestic violence, we have acknowledged that leaving is not an event, it's a process. So the process is in the room with the community. The process is with the police's partnership with social services and social services partnership with child protective services and, and, and when everybody works together takes responsibility it's harder to to defeat that group of people versus a single entity so when you see these community coordinated responses on college campuses and there's a lot of them in the states now you'll see an mou a memorandum of understanding where the campus police is working with local police is working with prosecutors working with advocates because we know, again, the crimes are so unreported because the victim has no resources. And I've told police for years, when you work with a victim of these kind of crimes, they don't need instructions. They need options. Uh, for years, we've looked at women and told them what to do, especially men. I've told male police officers for years, don't go to a home where you've got a domestic violence or sex assault victim and tell them what to do. They already have that. They live with an offender. So why would you want to do that again, right? So we're learning from one another. Uh, I'm an advocate trained police instructor. Advocates took me under their arm, you know, 35 years ago and said, let's train you. You don't know what you're doing. And I said, I agree. And they trained me. This is a, this is a different language. Um, I think most officers will tell you that when you get good at this work, you listen with a different ear. You listen to this young woman who talked about her experience and you hear those things that most people don't hear, the reluctance, you know, she gave, she finally said, stop saying no. All these things trigger something in your mind because they say things to you. This is a crime. It takes a skill to do that. And often advocates have trained us on how to sharpen those skills. So if you want to take a look at the White House uh, uh, Law Enforcement Partnership with College Universities, you can go online and I'm sorry I can't uh, give you all this. I think it's in your PowerPoint. Will they have a copy of the PowerPoint? That's great, perfect. So you'll have a copy of the PowerPoint and your locations. Take a look at the work that came out of these really, really incredible uh, summits that have been done on sex assault in the United States. Now, there's another side of, uh, of the United States where we've had cities that have had no prosecutions of sex assault. And in those cities, often, if they don't change their behavior, then our U.S. Department of Justice Civil Rights Division sometimes will take a look at that city to see if there's discrimination going on in that community. 
I just finished a year uh, study with our Civil Rights Division looking at the Chicago Police Department. And I looked at about 500 individual cases of sex assault and domestic violence, and there was discrimination in the cases. So now I'm working with Chicago Police to bring them up to a higher standard with their, with their sex assault and, and, uh, and their uh, domestic violence cases. And when we do these studies, we usually produce a finding on the city. So there's uh, several findings out there. Missoula, Montana was one that had uh, almost a complete indifference to rape. Now they're one of the best in the country. The New Orleans Police Department had an incredible amount of cases where the victim would call and report sex assault and the police would basically just throw the report in the trash can, wouldn't follow up on the cases. So these cities had high numbers of cases, not only to have high numbers of sex assault cases, it was witnessed that the police were interrogating the victims. They thought they had deception and their interview technique turned into an interrogation technique, which pushed victims away from, from police intervention and uh, again, keep making the law keep its promise. And I'll take a look at some of these reports later on if you have time. It's very interesting, uh, the findings. And I think what you'll notice here is a shift. And the shift is self-assessment. When you start assessing yourself, that's when you see the gaps in the system. And this is not, you don't care. That's not the statement that's made. It shows that you do care if you self-assess. One of the successful procedures that we're using nationwide now is what's called a community accountability and safety audit. We just finished one in my city. It took us two years. And we interviewed police and prosecutors and judges and dispatchers and paramedics and nurses and doctors. And we asked him questions about how do you provide your services? How can you do it better? Where are the gaps in the system? And after two years, we produced a full report to our community saying, here are the areas we're going to improve our community in. And because of our audit, we now are building the largest family justice center in the country, in Nashville, Tennessee, based on the, the, the shortcomings that my city had. And we're a pretty progressive town around domestic violence. So, Back to the mis misconceptions. So there's persistence of the rape myths and misconceptions that still float around, not only in criminal justice, but in society. So victim blaming happens. Victims are reluctant to report. And there's a lack of community engagement in, 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 uh, or in public discourse until recently. Now everyone's talking about it in the United States. And again, I'm not sure whether you follow the news from the States or not, but it's a big topic right now with, with our selection of our next Supreme Court justice whether he was a sexual predator or not. Uh, and we're going to see um, how the FBI investigates this gentleman. I have my suspicions, but I'll just I'll leave it there. Uh, so lack of training, this is another thing for first responders. You saw in the videotape that we should train our officers to understand things like trauma. Um, and this myth about, again, about sex offenders goes way, 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 way back for us. You know, we don't know what they look like. You know, we like to think they look a certain way. But they don't. Uh, they don't have name plates saying I'm a registered sex offender. They don't wear ski masks, right? They they don't tell us that they're rapists. It's something else. It's this offender. This is usually the rapist, right? Um, you'll hear these statements made by people. I couldn't imagine it was him. He's a nice guy. I liked him, you know. And now, uh, and again, I'm not sure whether you follow the news from our studies from the Catholic Church. Just in the state of Pennsylvania, 400 different parishes with over a thousand victims of sex assault just in one state alone. Now, New York State is starting to examine their diocese uh, there in New York. And I'm, uh, well, I don't know. We'll see what happens. But we're talking historic, long, long years ago of sex assault committed uh, inside of our Catholic Church. So it's someone the victim knows and trusts usually. And it's any age, it's any. It's any race, it's any, so that, when I hear people say it's a culture, there is a great culture, but the offenders come in all shapes and sizes. Some of my friends in Cleveland who are working cold case rapes now, there's a whole unit, Cleveland for cold case rapes, they're telling me they're catching offenders from 15, 16 years ago, they were in kits that weren't tested, and they're finding offenders who are raping women, raping men, raping white women, raping black women, raping maid women, raping old men, so raping everything. It's one of those odd profiles we've never seen before where the rapist just rapes. These are pure 100 percent predators. And it's been interesting to see the kind of cases come out of these studies. So uh, it, you know, it's not every guy, 
I, I want to make sure I, I make this point. I'm a 90-10 person. I think that 90% of crime is committed by 10% of the population. Um, but I think it's also up to us as men to talk about this issue. Um, one of the big problems, I think, is for men to break the myths that women are lying. And that's just a lie. Uh, the false reporting to law enforcement around 2 to 8%. Now, by the way, some of you all know this. These are studies, finally, scientific studies conducted by the Canadians, the Brits, you and us uh, in the States to look at false reporting. 2 to 8% is the same as false reporting to, as burglary and robbery, so it's no higher or lower than any other crime. Uh, there's been myths about that 50, 60, 70% reporting to false reporting of rape. So, how much time have I got again? We're about out of time. <laughs> Well, then let me show you this. Don't, don't look at the screen. It'll make you dizzy. Let me, I want to show you one last thing. And this, this describes to me, well, I'll let you decide. This is a case in Phoenix, Arizona. And a good friend of mine, who is a sex crimes investigator, was in his office. We haven't been involved. Phoenix so is a big city. He's in his office one day working rape cases, and inside the Phoenix Police Department, he's got a background investigator who investigates potential candidates for the Phoenix Police Department. Every agency has one, or two or three. They do an interview with this potential candidate to be a police officer in Phoenix, and while they're doing the interview, they're about to give him a polygraph exam, a standard for screening for police. So this is the pretest. He asks him certain questions before he does the final test. In the past, background investigators would not ask questions about domestic violence and sex assault, but they are today. So that's changing in the way we hire young people to work in policing. This is what they call by a candidate. This guy wanted to be a cop. Involved in or even accused of a sexual assault or date rape? Uh, that one, maybe. What? I was, uh, I don't know if. This constitutes state rape, but I was with this girl and she was passed out. I had sex with her. Okay. About how old are you? 22. And she passed out from alcohol or drugs? Alcohol. And there was another one. I was 24. Did she make any, either make any complaint or anything? No. And you did it again to a different girl in, at age 24? Yeah. And uh, where were these, inc where did these incidents occur in Connecticut? One was in Connecticut, one was in uh, Oregon. So the first one was in? Oh no, I'm sorry, it was in New Hampshire. The first one was in New Hampshire. Went back to my old college. And then the second one, when I was 24, was uh, in Oregon. I met a girl for the weekend. She was passed out. I did that. And we've all been there, too. <laughs> okay. Now, let me just, let me, let me just explain to you what you just saw. I, I could not believe this when I saw this film. He went on to admit to another rape. He, he admitted to three rapes. This is a serial rapist, obviously. He's trying to get a job with the Phoenix Police Department. They didn't hire him. Let me just make that clear. But why do you think this kind of personality wants to be a police officer? That power. Right. Yeah. Every cop on the planet will tell you, you don't get into law enforcement because you want to drive fast and you get a free cup of coffee. <laughs> it's something a little more complicated. You care about people. You care enough about people to risk your own life with people you don't know. This is a different group of people. The law enforcement, it cares about the public, but when someone calls law enforcement, they're broken, their minds are broken, their hearts are broken, their bodies are broken, they need our help desperately. What better population to prey on than that population? Think about that for a second. Now, he didn't get a job. They investigated this guy. They went back to places where he lived, but there were no police reports because you heard what he said. She passed out and I had sex with him. He raped her, right? This, this is the undetected rapist. This is the rapist that we Fear is out there committing so many of these crimes that we have not even begun to detect yet. That sophisticated offender who makes sure she has enough alcohol or she has no memory of it, or he drops some drug on her roof and all under a drink and she loses time and she passes out and she's right while she's unconscious. So this is, I think, sort of horizon for us. It's sort of, it's sort of we're just moving into a new awareness of policing in the States about how 
how many victims we have, how inadequate we've been in policing, how a lack of policies have contributed to that, how myths and misconceptions about sex assault victims have contributed to it. And the victims have all while have said, I'm here ready and waiting for you when you are sophisticated enough to help me. That's where we are. Uh, and I, you know, I, I wish I could say we were further down the road and doing better, but I think we're at this point now, at least in the states where we're saying, we admitted that we've done it wrong and we're here to make it right. Uh, so if I had another hour or two, we could talk more about this. You've got a copy of the PowerPoint. My email address, I believe is in the PowerPoint. I recommend if you heard me say something or stay to study or talk about a procedure, let me know. Uh, drop me a line. Go to the you know uh, the email. Drop, drop me a line. So let me give you my email address. If you didn't see it on the screen, it's m a r k w y n n at edge e d g e dot net. I correspond with prosecutors all over the world. Police advocates. And it makes me smarter because I know there's a lot of really smart people watching this uh, presentation today. And uh, if you ask me to share with with you, then you share with me, and then we'll correspond, and I'll give you anything that, that I that I can give you, including a copy of this PowerPoint. By the way, if you want this PowerPoint, take it, take my name, your name off of it, put your name on it, tell your boss you wrote it. I don't care. <laughs> I mean, I don't care. <laughs> and, you know, it's about sharing with one another, and we're all in this together. Whether you're an advocate, or a cop, or a prosecutor, or a judge. This is all about us working together, right? So, thank you. Thank you. Mark, thank you so much. That was insightful. We definitely should have had you for three hours. Now, I'm conscious we've got over 100 people on a link, sure. so their time will be limited. So, unfortunately, we won't go to questions. All the internet group here, we can certainly carry on, and I said they would welcome your time for a chat. Sure. For those on the link, if you've posted questions or we have some that were posted pre this, we are going to endeavour to have a chat with Mark uh, sometime this afternoon and record a question and answer session that we might also post for you. As Mark said, we will be um, uh, attaching and sending out your PowerPoint and can I thank you for your generosity, your insights and the time you've given. Very thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. So this is with Mark Wynn following uh, just an excellent presentation by Mark regarding sexual assault, a presentation as part of um, uh, Sexual Violence Awareness Month. Uh, Mark, it was for those that were on the presentation uh, on the link, also know that the, um, the PowerPoint is up on our website and we encourage people to have the, um, to listen to it. Um, what we're covering now is some questions that came through from those who were on the um, Zoom link, so not in the room, Mark, and we just didn't want anyone to miss out, so we're covering those questions. So the first one is, how can we as a community overcome the barriers related to victims of sexual assault being disenfranchised, that is, being accused of making false accusations about crimes perpetrated against them, particularly those women who come forward to report historic crimes. So the, 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 the gist of the question is how can we as a community be more responsive to, to victims, right? <laughs> Considering the history they've gone through. Yeah. Uh, th this is the, really the heart of the issue for us in the states. It's not so much about what the victim's doing or not doing, it's what we're doing as a community. So it's harder for an offender to manipulate, to defeat, to keep the victim from justice, to manipulate the victim when there's a community there to support her. It's not just, you know, what do you, when are you going to leave? It's what are we prepared to do when she decides to leave or she reports? Which means we've got to educate ourselves. And what we've seen uh, in the states is that often when you've got different organizations that do very similar things like social services and law enforcement and the judicial and the and medicine is that we've stovepiped ourselves where we do our job really well every day without any help from anybody else, but we don't know what you do or what the prosecutor does or what the judge does or what the police do. So one of the things I recommend if for a true community coordinated response, which is a partnership between government and non-government entities, 
for the for the protection of and the accountability of offenders. Mm -hmm. But the protection of victims, accountability of offenders, is to get to know one another. Mm. Now, I've been to communities mm. all over the yeah. country where they say, well, I don't really know what Child Protective does. I don't know what the Red Cross Center does. And I ask them, why not? Why don't you have a day-long show and tell, have rape crisis come and show the police and the judge and the prosecutor what services they provide, have the probation come in and talk about when do we violate probation. And when you see communities start to do that, yeah. then you start to hear this. I had a woman that came in, she said she'd been raped. I wasn't sure about the trauma. I needed someone who was an expert in the interview technique, so I called my friend, the counselor at the Rape Crisis Center. Mm -hmm. She came over, we got together, I've got her cell phone number. So when you see, even in big cities, when you see people personalize it, where they have each other's cell phone numbers, where they know a certain person has expertise in a certain thing, that's when you see victims get not only justice, but it's safety as well. Mm -hmm. But what victims are often telling us is when they come to our system is that they'll find a gap in the system and the gap pushes them back. The gap may be some misconception about, well, she's making it up, she's lying, she's not telling the truth. Or, and when they do that, then the evidence, the physical evidence will start to erode, they start to lose trust in us, they won't call us anymore. And the, the, the secondary problem is for sex assault, that offender goes on to rape other women. These offenders just don't stop and warn you, so there's more than one victim. So you have to be able to assess yourself. You have to look at yourself. You have to do a climate survey. You, you know, I love these climate surveys yeah. where you look inside your organization and you say, we have a full, complete understanding of sex assault and we're here to offer the options and protections a victim need. And if you don't, then as a responsible leader in your community, you say, what don't we know? Mm -hmm. What is it that we're confused about because we can't just wait yeah. until the midnight shift when she walks in the emergency room where yeah. she's been raped. Mm -hmm. We have to do it now. Mm -hmm. And another thing too is leaving the voice of the victim out of the conversation. We did this for years. We thought, oh, we're great. We're doing a great job. We do this. We do that. And then someone says, yeah, but what does the victim think about it? So there's got to be a continual focus on the victim's needs mm -hmm. and the way the victim feels about the system. I just did uh, a group of uh, focus groups in the state of Virginia for about a year. And I travel around the state and I talk to what we call underserved populations. Immigrant women, uh, African American women, and older women. Yeah. Very unreported in those populations. And I asked these women, I, I had a battery of questions that I asked them about themselves and about their own culture. Mm -hmm. That was a starting point. And for the immigrant women I heard, food and religion and family and tradition, wonderful things that you think, wow, we want this person in our country, you know. And then I asked the service providers the same questions. Mm -hmm. The judges, the legal aid attorneys, the police, what do you know about the culture of immigrant women? And I heard guns and drugs and violence and gangs. And these are good people, these are really good people who love their job, they love working with people. Mm -hmm. They just did not understand the culture yeah. of the population that they service. Yeah. That's another issue. Do you understand the Aboriginal population? Do you understand the immigrant population? One, not to go off on a tangent, but let me just tell you one instance. We had a series of murders in the Northwest, uh, in the Southeast Asian communities, Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia, who had immigrated, and some were political refugees to the United States. And the police were curious because they had a high number of homicides, domestic murders in that population. And when they searched their database, there was no outreach from the victim to the police. And they said, well, if they contacted us, maybe we could have done something. But someone smart in the community said, why aren't they asking us? So they went out and did outreach in the communities. And they heard from the families from Laos and Cambodia and Vietnam you don't understand our culture. In our home countries, you don't call the police, the police call you. So there was a breakdown in the basic understandings of the culture of the, of the families that they policed. Again, I didn't mean to go off on a long tangent. No, and like what I'm hearing you say also at the 
crux of all this is talk to each other, yeah. talk to victims, but we've got service providers, everyone in their, you know, their specialisations, mm -hmm. going, try, wanting the same thing, right. but not knowing what each other does. Right. It's a critical way they connect and know right. for a better response. Can I throw at you something that's often said, which is, but we don't have the resources. We'd love to do more, but we don't have the funding, or we don't have the staff, or we, you know, we don't have enough resources to do that. Do you think it's a resource problem, or do you think it's uh, something that needs to be prioritised? I think there are priorities you have to have in government service. Um, but I think if you want to see some real immediate impact, when you close the gaps in your community, you start to see those immediate impacts. The numbers of arrests can go down, yeah. the number of homicides can go down, yeah. the more successful prosecutions of rape can happen. Yeah. The, um, the numbers of victims overall will lower because you're holding offenders accountable and you've got a, an offender who repeats the crimes against multiple victims, then you have to look at the long, the long view of it. I, I, I've, I remember very well doing the uh, money equation mm. on arrests mm. for my police department. Yeah. Every time we put handcuffs on a suspect, it cost a thousand dollars. Basically, because all the money support the law enforcement get, came down to supporting an officer on the street, mm. making a single arrest. And we had offenders who we'd arrested 30, 40, 50 times with no consequences. Yeah. When we focused on those offenders, we lowered those numbers of arrests, therefore lowered overall cost of policing domestic violence. But the cost of violence to women is much bigger than anyone had ever suspected. We don't know how many billions of dollars of lost work, of long-term health impacts, of, mm -hmm. of, of, of a suicide, of homicide, of, mm -hmm. of hospital bills, mm -hmm. the civil expenses. The state of Kentucky, just one state, estimated that the issuances of protective orders in a single year save that state $84 million because if the orders are enforced, the victims are protected, those families don't have to be a repeat call for police. So you have to look at the cost risk benefit factor. And I think the smart thing to do is to spend more money in the, in the beginning to lower the cost. Because this is not going to stop. No, no, no. Until there's a meaningful community intervention. One of the methods that I think has been so successful is what we call a community safety and accountability audit. It's a scientific process where you, the community, become your own auditors. And if you're a judge, I sit down with you and I say, Judge, tell me what you would do to fix the system. If I'm a, you know, a chief, you would ask me, how could you be more effective with your patrol officer? Or if you're a hospital administrator, how do you do a better job at the emergency room setting with sex assault victims? And when you do that, you get this honest statement that says, man, we should do this, we should do that. And you can see that there are things that you can immediately do to have an immediate impact on this population. And you fill the gaps. But what it does, too, it sends a message to the victims, we're willing to look at ourselves yeah. and say, what are we not doing mm. to protect you? Yes, and that makes all the difference when there's yeah. a perception that you talk to someone who's responsive. If you pay today, or you pay tomorrow. Mm. And, uh, and the thing is, the victim is one that pays the bill often. Yeah. And, you know, I've had chiefs, i talk to chiefs nationwide uh, about innovation and you know, progressive policing, and they bring up the fact, well, I can't do that. And I said, you know, chief, you know, there's no saying, you know, no bucks, no buck rogers. So if you look at this the right way and you focus your attention on these offenders, then not only are you doing some really immediate safety for the families and safety for your police, you're go lower the numbers of potential offenders for the future. We've generated uh, generations of offenders mm. by inaction in government, mm. and now we're paying the price. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, thank you, Mark. The uh, next question was, what needs to occur for the language used in media reports covering crimes of a sexual nature to change? Yeah, that's a great question, because, you know, you, the public's informed by the media. I was a reporter before I was a police officer. Oh. Out of your bio. Yeah, well, it's, it, it's not as big as that. It's about three years. And, and I really enjoyed working for a newspaper, but 
there is a culture in the media that's been there for years to call these love triangles or crimes of passion and not to give it um, the true depth and description of what it really is. And it, of course, reporters are, are, are very aware and they care about the community as well, but the language of the media has to be, well, they have to be educated. And that means the way we communicate to the media. If you're in law enforcement, yeah. the language you use with the media has to not only be informative, it has to be corrective. If we're doing a, a news broadcast from our police or our courts to the media and they, then they say, well, this is a crime of passion that happens every day, it's our opportunity and leadership, uh, and anyone can be a leader, to say, well, that may be your point of view, but let me tell you what's really happening in my community. Last year, we had a thousand sex assault cases. We were unable to prosecute this number. We were able to get assistance for this victim. Here are the needs of victims of sex assault. They have a need to be believed. We should use every podium, every moment to broadcast the language and the needs of the victim to change the language of the media that educates the public. Mm -hmm. So the words of the victim go unnoticed and unspoken unless we speak them. Yeah. Um, and then, by the way, not only is it important for the media to understand then we need to educate the media about what's really happening, mm -hmm. We have to talk to the victims because the bigger problem for us often is underreporting. Yeah. So the way we speak, so you can imagine this, you're a rape victim and you're watching a news account of the local police commander talking about sex assault and you hear the right thing. We believe victims who've been raped. We, be, we want to help you. We have service with you. And that victim who's sitting there thinking, okay, it's time for me to report. The power in that is unmeasurable. Yeah. I, you just, because the victim says, I finally heard this wonderful person say that they could contact me with a rape crisis center. I tell police chiefs often, it's something as simple as looking at your own department's website. Mm -hmm. You look at a website, and I'm a rape victim, and I'm trying to find services. Mm -hmm. How many pages and pull downs do I have to go to to I find the right page that says, if you're a rape victim, contact this number. If I can't find it, that's a form of communication. That shows what your priority is. But if I open up your page as a police agent and I see if you're a rape victim, here's a number called the very first moment. That tells a victim, we know this is an issue and we want to protect you. So that kind of communication is assist and support and is, communi uh, is communicating to the media. Yeah, it all links too, doesn't it? It's all links. When we get a common language, yes. then we, yes. the, the offender doesn't win. Because the offender is the one that interjects the language of minimization in the conversation. Yeah. Boys will be boys. Boy. Right? Yes. Right. It just yeah. drives me crazy. He said, she said. Yeah. When it should be, he said, he said, we said. Mm -hmm. We as the community, the yeah. service providers, the police, and yeah. her. Yeah. Um, it is fascinating, the, the misuse of language by offenders, right. certainly. Um, next question. How do we, as community, combat men's rights groups who serve drops of Kate and generate misleading false statistics around gendered violence. I'd maybe suggest it's not just the men's rights group, but you know, we talked in your presentation about she's also violent and you know, there is, or it's not only about women, it's about men. And in saying that, we know men can be victims too. Well, so absolutely. Yeah. No, I think it's a mistake not to acknowledge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm a survivor of domestic violence. I grew up from 1959-1969 as a child growing up mm. in a home full of domestic violence. And we should be accurate about this. What we've seen in the States is most often when men are victims of domestic violence, it's been perpetrated by men. Mm. Brothers, fathers, yes. grandfathers, uh, gay relationships. Um, there are victims there. We shouldn't ignore that. I think, you know, the domestic violence, the laws around domestic violence are gender blind for a very good reason. Because there's no gender written usually in the criminal code. It just talks about victims, uh, which includes men as well. Elder, we, we, we're starting to see our elder population go higher because our baby boomers are now aging. We see elder men being beaten by their partners, their children, uh, sexually assaulted by people in daycare centers. Um, so they're there. We have to admit that. But when we do our studies in law enforcement numbers,
numbers, and I know that academics do their studies as well. What we see is most often the offenders are male, and I can't, I cannot change that fact. These are these are just the numbers we see in the natural progression of policing nationwide. Ninety percent of the offenders in sex assault and child abuse and rape are male. Again, that doesn't exclude male victims. So I'm not offended by men's rights group. They have a right to say what they want to say. They don't have a right to their own facts. Yeah. You know, there is a set of facts that belong to all of us. Mm -hmm. So I'd recommend, and I've had men's groups come to my trainings before, and I welcome them to my trainings, to listen to how we're looking at these crimes of, uh, against women. And we say crimes against women because that's most often who the victims are. So, yeah. right. so and, but acknowledging right. that men are right. as victims. Um, last question, how can we as agents of change encourage more men to participate in raising awareness and combating sexual violence against women? Well, you know, I, th th there are a couple of things that I recommend for men. Uh, and one is, how do we talk to our young men? There's another communication issue. Yeah. Uh, how do we talk to our young men about how we treat and look at women? Um, I ask men to take a close look at our modern culture, and there's, I believe there is a modern rape culture that becomes so pervasive that you can't see it anymore. It's just around us in modern advertisement, in the media, in conversations between men. But I think, too, it's up to us as men to talk to other men about this. I mean, the, the women know this. But I tell you know, police commanders all the time, if you're walking through your police station and you hear two men talking about women in a derogatory way, it's your job mm -hmm. to stop mm -hmm. and ask the question, let's process this. Mm -hmm. There's a famous, and I know, I would say that almost every Australian saw this a couple of years ago when you had your scandal in the Australian Army. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, pictures of Australian female soldiers being shared with male soldiers and the general of the Australian Army uh, did a video on, on YouTube. And if you just go into YouTube, the you know, Australian General Army, he gives this speech about his feeling about violence against women. And he says this, that if we as men walk past that behavior and don't intervene and educate, then that behavior becomes a standard for our organization. How powerful is that? It's, it's, it is not just accountability, it's responsibility. It's acknowledging that we are often the perpetrators of these crimes. The White Ribbon Campaign that came out of Canada, um, Michael Crawford or Crawford, I, I may get that wrong, started White Ribbon after, in the early 80s, I believe a man walked into a university in Montreal and lined up women and men, he separated them. I think he killed about 14 women in what they call the Montreal Massacre. Yeah. Yeah. And while he was killing these women, he was telling these students, I'm here to stop feminism. The hatred for women was obviously mm -hmm. evident. Mm -hmm. But what Crawford said, or Crawford said was, it's up to us to declare this an epidemic as men. It's up to us to say we have to say enough is enough. And we have to join together. And our biggest audience is our next generation of men. That is the, that is the next stop for us. We often do experiential training with our police chiefs in the states. We try to put our chiefs in the shoes of victims. We have a whole experiential exercise we call In Her Shoes. And we, the police chief becomes the victim. Sometimes they're killed, sometimes they're sexually assaulted. We process it with them, and that's the big payoff. Yes. Because if you've never felt vulnerable, if you've never felt powerless, it's hard to associate with yes. it. And we have these heart-to-hearts, and these chiefs say, I've got to talk to my son. And that's what you think. That's what we want to hear. To make that difference. Yeah, yes, White yeah. Ribbon um, in Australia is very it's strong. Incredible and there's also, with what you said when you walk by, you know, there's also a lot on bystander effect. And we just did a presentation the other day. Yeah. Mark, thank you so much for covering those questions. Thank I really you. I appreciate it. Oh, I'm honored to be here. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am.